Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. In our Sunday uh, videos, we're going through the book of Acts. Uh, we just completed 2 Corinthians a week or so ago. I began this as, uh, on the, on the, with the idea that we're going to go through it verse by verse. Uh, there are 28 chapters that probably take me several years, and so we have decided to do a survey of the book of Acts, probably cover a couple of chapters every video. 28 chapters, that's probably, I guess what that's, 14 weeks. Uh, and then we can move on to something else. I hate to be uh, involved in, in such a lengthy uh, series given the, the time that we're, that we're in. So I hope that that's okay with everyone. It's been, it's been many, many years since I've done a, a survey of any uh, New Testament books, so I just ask you for your prayers. Uh, and before we begin, let's just have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, for there is no other means. And in the Holy Spirit, thanking you for just who you are, all you've done in our lives. I just want to ask you to filter out all of that uh, which is said, which is foolish, which is uh, carnal, but seal to our hearts that was, which is truth, truth that you would have us know that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. So we've just begun to look at the book of Acts. Uh, uh, so very quickly, uh, by a, a way of review, the Holy Spirit has used Luke to pen these words. Uh, Luke, a Gentile, uh, wrote m more of the New Testament than any other individual under the leadership and the inspiration of God. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, he's led by the Holy Spirit to declare that he has perfect understanding from above. Your authorized version says from the very first, uh, the very first that, the, the Greek words is another, uh, from above, God inspired Luke. The true author of both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Luke's only the instrument by which God has given us His Word. Ob obviously, Theophilus has become a, a brother in Christ. I pointed out uh, how that the word there means friend of God. Uh, Moses was a friend of God. Uh, uh, Noah was a friend of God. Abraham was a friend of God. You're a friend of God if you're a believer in Christ. Uh, some think he was a Roman general. There, there are many views on who Theophilus was. The Word doesn't tell us, uh, which is often the case. So uh, in that, to that uh, extent, all we can do is speculate. But uh, the Holy Spirit directs this epistle for his understanding. Uh, I would suggest that uh, it's he represents believers in Christ. I suggested to you that in the Gospels, the Holy Spirit held up the Lord Jesus Christ as a four-sided diamond uh, somewhat. Uh, we see Him as King, we see Him as servant, we see Him as man, and we see Him as God in the book of Acts. Or in the, in the book of John, we see Him as God. Uh, we see him as God in the book of Acts. We probably see him as all, all facets of that diamond in the book of Acts. On the other hand, we see what it means when the Lord prayed, I pray I prayed not that you take them out of the world system, but that you keep them in the world system. And it seems as though we've moved from a mountaintop to a valley in the account in the book of Acts. It's, it's very similar to the wanderings of the children of Israel uh, in, the, in the wilderness, we see the pains and the sufferings incurred in carrying on the truth of the Word of God in the religious system. We're also told that as we begin the book of Acts, that the Lord revealed Himself to those whom He had called. He did not come and spend 
anytime convincing Herod or Pilate or any other person that he was God and that he had risen from the dead. He spent his time with those whom uh, he had chosen, not those who had chosen him, but those whom he had chosen. Uh, in verse 3, we found that he gave them very he gave them many infallible proofs that he had risen from the dead. It isn't that just once he showed himself to be alive, but that continuously over a period of 40 days, he fellowshiped with those whom he had chosen. And in every way, they found it to be true that he really was alive. He really had risen from the dead. So beginning then at verse 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. He fellowshiped with them in eating. Now that may not mean anything to you, uh, but it's definite proof uh, to the thinking mind that the, the Lord Jesus Christ was not a disembodied spirit, but that he in fact was, uh, but, or, in fact, did eat physical food with his disciples. The uh, Gospel of John then uh, closed with that uh, same account. Uh, he ate broiled fish and toast with his disciples on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, uh, which is a, a most embarrassing, I guess, account for the Jehovah's Witnesses. He's not a uh, disembodied spirit. Uh, he's risen. God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh. Uh, and in that uh, risen body, we know from the book of Colossians that all of the completeness, all of the fullness of the deity uh, settled down permanently in bodily form uh, in, Christ, in Christ. So he ate together with them and he commanded them that they should uh, not depart from Jerusalem, but that they should wait for the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Father, of course, is is that prophecy of Joel. They would be baptized in the future uh, with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they came together uh, and their last question was, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? And we know that the purpose of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was to redeem us and call us into the family and the household of God, uh, the kingdom of God. He told them it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. The, the word times there is chronos. The word seasons is kairos. Uh, I pointed out uh, in the introduction that uh, one word means the passage of time, chronological time. Uh, the other means the appointed time. And He's very definitely saying that they they were not to know in an experiential way, gnosko is the word, uh, the passage of time, the amount of time that must pass, nor the appointed time. And I suggested to you that is simply not true of the generation that immediately uh, precedes our Lord's return. It cannot be. So there was a, uh, it's a, re there was a, there's a reason to pay attention to those important personal pronouns there and, and, and take note of who any passage is speaking to. Who is being addressed in the passage? Uh, in my introduction, I also remember stating quite clearly that if you told me that the rapture you know, will occur on some date, date, like just, well, just pick one, you know, February 1st, 2030, you know, I'd probably stop listening to you. Uh, the Lord cautioned them, His disciples, not to attempt to set dates. Of course, I think there's an application to us, the same application today. We don't set dates. We're not dogmatic about a particular date. doesn't mean we can't know the season, especially if we're that final generation. I think if, if they had begun doing that, you and I wouldn't be here doing this, you know, because uh, God had a plan for these witnesses at that time, which 
which had to do with our beginning, the beginning of the church. Not, it was not for the apostles to know. God gave us enough information so that we would not be disquieted nor discouraged, uh, but He did not reveal any specific dates. And, and I believe that's a good thing. I think it's, it's great that young people can't see the, the life that lays ahead of them. Most of them, I'm certain, would be totally discouraged. You do not know what pain and suffering might face you in the immediate future. You just, we just don't know that. God told us that He has a plan, that He has a program, that He's appointed the times and the seasons. The Father has those in His own power and authority. He's told us that not one jot or tittle of His Word will pass away. And our primary concern is the Gospel and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the proclamation of the Word of God, not an attempt to set dates and remove ourselves from the, the conflict of that activity. I also suggested that uh, given our place in human history, it would be foolish not to, to, to shout from the mountaintops that our Lord's return is near. Uh, even much of the non-believing world today is convinced that He's coming soon. That was not for them to know. What will happen is, is that they will receive power. That's The word is dunamis. Uh, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in some area and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It's, it's commonly taught, and we're all wrapped up into the fact that we are uh, God's witnesses. Uh, I suggest very cautiously to you that I do not see anyone called witnesses for Christ except the apostles. I believe you are, you are an ambassador to Christ. I believe that you carry the ministry of reconciliation, but I can't find where you, that you are uh, said to be a witness. And yet, of course, popular uh, modern uh, evangelism teaches us that we are witnesses primarily because of a verse like this and a couple others in the gospel where the Lord is addressing His apostles if you believe very strongly that this verse is to you, then that's between you and the Lord. Uh, my purpose here is not to get anyone to agree with my convictions and the results of my study. The purpose of our fellowshipping together here is just to study this book together, see if we can find out what it says to us and your responsibility and your uh, answer is to the Lord, not to me. Uh, the context limits the word witnesses to the disciples. There are others who are, are going to be called disciples uh, shortly, but I find the term witness, uh, witnesses is a, a technical term in the Scriptures apparently only applying to the apostles. Uh, and in their witness, we have the Word of God. We have the testimony of Paul that the Holy Spirit used Paul used him to complete the Word of God, it seems to me that that's the witness. And now what we do is become ambassadors for Christ. Uh, we become ministers of what this witness says. Folks, you won't add uh, a book to this book. Uh, you will not add a word to the Word of God. God has completed His Word and God has preserved His Word. I, I believe that the witness of the Word of God is not only in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but also to the uttermost parts of the earth as far as we can find out uh, the world, uh, the known world by 200 A.D. all had copies of the Word of God and they had missionaries in, in their country. When He had spoken these things while they watched Him, in fact, the Greek says, while they intently looked at Him, he was taken up in a cloud and received out of their sight. And now we have uh, two messengers who stand there, two men arrayed in white apparel. They were arrayed in white apparel, and, the, and they, they said, Ye men 
of Galilee, ye men of Galilee. That's the, the foreign area of Palestine. These men were Galileans. They were not the high level of Israeli citizenship. Uh, yet the Lord still calls them. Uh, God has not called many high, many wise, many, many mighty, many noble in the service and in the work of, of the Lord. Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This exact same Jesus, uh, the word is very precise. This exact person, this Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in exactly the same way as he has. Uh, you've seen him go into heaven. They, they saw him go personally into heaven. He will return personally from heaven. Our blessed hope is... Uh, is our blessed hope. You know, I have no idea uh, when that'll be. There are uh, a multitude of factors that appear to confirm that the Lord's re return is near. Uh, I think it is, but I'm free to think that. I still live in a free country, at least for the time being. Uh, may not be for 500 years. I don't know. We have been called to a faithfulness in stewardship and anticipation of fellowship and communion with our Savior, uh, looking for the glorious appearing of the great God. We're not to become discouraged if it doesn't happen tonight or next week or next year. Uh, this is the way you saw Him go. This is the way He is going to return. Our hope is in the Lord. Our citizenship is in glory. So they return to Jerusalem from the Mount uh, of Olives, uh, which is from Jerusalem. That's a Sabbath day's journey. Uh, according uh, to the map, that's not very far. Uh, you can walk it in no time. I, uh, uh, I haven't been there, but I've looked at the map. It's you can go down into the uh, the brook uh, Kidron and up the other side through the gate into the city. I mean, it's just a short walk. They returned to Jerusalem. They came in. They went into an upper room. Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, uh, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Uh, they, they all lived in this upper room and they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They fellowshiped uh, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with the brethren. Now they waited and Peter said while they were waiting, he stood up in the midst of the disciples, stood up in their midst, I do believe there were about 120 of them there. Or at least the text says this. Uh, not 12 or 11 or 10. Uh, and Peter stood up and said, uh, now there's certain things that have been fulfilled. The Holy Spirit uh, even said by David concerning Judas that this was going to happen. Uh, he was numbered with us. He obtained part of this ministry and then he he purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and so forth. Uh, you all know that. Uh, and that field is even known to this day. It's, uh, you look on a map, you can see that. I was looking at that the other night. It's, uh, uh, I can't imagine owning that property. Uh, uh, the record uh, has it that the... Uh, you know, Ju Judas gave him back the money. Uh, the uh, chief priests went and bought the field. Uh, anyhow, uh, therefore, it, in verse 21, therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have accompanied us the whole time the, that the Lord went out in and out among us. Uh, verse 22, beginning from John's baptism until the day Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Um, that's one of the reasons I suggested to you that I see the term witness limited 
to the disciples. We need somebody to fill this gap as a witness. And so they nominated two. Uh, now you can do what you will with the Greek. They appointed two. Uh, however, by that appointment, this was not the laying on of hands or, or ordaining them as, as disciples or as apostles. Uh, the, the language argues for a nomination. They nominated two, Justice and, and Matthias, and then they prayed and they said, Lord, we believe, uh, let, let me uh, freely translate here. We believe that you've appointed us as witnesses. You must have chosen one of these two to fill the gap. Now show us which one you chose that he may take part in this ministry and, and in, in this apostleship. The, uh, the earliest translations of the word are ballot. They cast their ballots. Uh, I'm, I have to come to the conclusion that the, the 120 that were gathered uh, together, they voted, they cast a, a ballot, and that ballot fell upon Matthias, and therefore he was numbered with the 11. So if I know how to count, then, then uh, the 13th apostle comes along, Paul, uh, through whom God winds up writing 13 epistles. Now in chapter 2, we have the coming of the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. They were all in one accord in one place, and then there was a sound, the rushing of mighty wind, and the Holy Spirit came upon each and every one of them. I would love it if you all would just take a moment to look beyond the words and try to imagine what this was like. The Holy Spirit came upon each and every one of them. The language, once, once again, is very precise, very dogmatic. They were, there were not some who did not receive the Holy Spirit. There were not some who had more of the Spirit than others. Uh, when He came, He sat upon every single one of them. It's, it's a, a popular move today to try to get people either filled with the Spirit or baptized by the Spirit uh, a a program which I believe is entirely foreign to the Word of God. These believers were there waiting for the beginning of a ministry which God had given them and they were attached by the Holy Spirit as every Christian has been since. As we see in uh, Corinthians, you are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. It is not a result of something that you do some kind of exercise through which you pass. It is the program of God that in this age of grace, we are led, we are controlled, we are con consoled, comforted by the Holy Spirit. Verse four, they were all, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There were no exceptions. The word filled is, is not like our English word as though we you know, you would pour, we'd pour something into a vessel and, and, and until it runs over. Uh, but it is rather more like the word to be controlled by, uh, to be under the power of or, or the authority of the Holy Spirit. They began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance, and we, and we have now the second case in the Word of God of speaking in what people call tongues. Uh, the first, of course, was in Isaiah where God pronounced that the day would come that He would speak to His people in other languages. Uh, there can be no argument in, in this context that the other tongues spoken of here were languages. They were actual languages, you know, where, where Medes and Persians and Romans, Greeks, uh, etc., and so, so on and so forth, they heard the gospel in their own language. In the fifth verse, we have another indication of the extreme uh, dogmatism of the Bible that, that really drives many a professing Christian crazy. It just seems as though that we would prefer the Scriptures more if God said that the odds are if you did this, things would be better. 
you know, or uh, the odds are that a lot of people are going to go to hell. Uh, it'd be super, you know, if, if verse 5 said that most, most every nation was represented there, or a lot of nations were represented there. But clearly, the text says that God had gathered uh, at Jerusalem thereafter devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, if you don't believe that, that uh, of course, that's your prerogative. Uh, there's, that's, that's one beautiful advantage of living in a free country. You can be as free as you want to be. It, it is difficult for me to treat the Word of God loosely. I believe this is God's Word. I don't believe that it contains God's Word or, or that uh, some of the things God wrote are inspired and, and some of the things are not. God in His uh, majestic power had devout men from every nation under heaven there and all of a sudden the gospel is preached in all of the world. All. No, all of the world. Everywhere. There are five passages of Scripture that will tell you that by the end of the disciples' generation, the gospel had been preached in all the world. There were men, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. You know, Passover was a popular event uh, attended by every... Uh, organized government in, in I don't know, relation to Rome. A city that was very small by comparison to Rome. It suddenly swells to uh, uh, I don't know, just all these people coming to Jerusalem for Passover. Visiting uh, dignitaries, common people, Sacrifices were made by the hundreds of thousands. It was, it was a popular time. Uh, Jesus Christ was crucified outside the city along with at least two other men, probably four other men. And now somehow the electrifying news has gone uh, throughout the city that he's risen from the dead. And it is just impossible for me to conceive that only 11 disciples went out and looked at that cave and said, yep, it's empty. Must have been throngs of people going out there. Wouldn't surprise me if someone had set up a gate there and started charging admission to see it. I know that it was popularly known that that tomb was empty. Uh, I believe Pilate knew it was empty. I believe Herod knew it was empty. I, I know that the soldiers knew it was empty. Are you suggesting that none of these people talked to their wives, their friends, their cousins, their aunts, their uncles, or the people that they worked with? Or somehow we have been led to believe in a lot of our, our, our schooling that these, these, were, <coughs> these were archaic, uneducated people. Folks, they didn't have automobiles because they didn't want them. I think we invent what we need. They had running water in their homes. A middle income family had 10 servants. Do you have 10 servants? I, I don't have 10 servants. So. They, did, they, didn't, uh, they didn't live a bad life. The average person in the city of Jerusalem could read and write, I mean, read and write fluently Seven languages. Seven. Wasn't unusual. You probably can't. I mean, I can barely speak one. Copies of the Word of God were so common by 100 AD that women were writing their grocery lists on the back of them, even though printing presses hadn't been invented. 
Now, I think the city was electrified. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's looking at these disciples. They now have uh, 120, at least, followers. And now we have the, the experience of, of control by the Holy Spirit. They were confounded because every single man heard these disciples speak in their own language. Folks, that is not any confusion of tongues. You know, like, it, like uh, interestingly, God did to, to, ba to babble. You know, that isn't, that isn't any so-called uh, ecstatic uh, uh, utterance that no one can understand. It's not gibberish. These people heard the gospel in their own language, and they marveled, saying one to another, Are, aren't all these guys G Galileans? Now we hear, you know, everyone in our own tongue, they said. There, there's an inference in the language that they hear well, that whoever is speaking this language is speaking it accurately so that they comprehend easily in their own language. Persians, Medes, and the list goes on. Doesn't say China or Japan or the United States. What I have is an account of the Holy Spirit that there were men, devout men from every nation under heaven. You know, I'm sorry, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if there are some groups or nations or peoples that God does not consider nations. You know, like the Canaanites, you know, you know, they were to be utterly destroyed. Every man, woman, child, every animal. Does, folks, does God have the right to do that? Well, of course He does. What I have to conclude is that out of that multitude of people, those nations were represented there who contained members of the chosen body of Christ and they heard in their own language. They were all amazed. They were perplexed. What does all this mean? Others mocked and said, well, they're drunk. I think there'd be a tremendous appeal for liquor if I could speak fluently in other languages. Peter says, y'all ain't making a lick of sense. First of all, this is only the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. This isn't a time when normal people would be drunk, only alcoholics. I, you know, I, I want to preach, and so he reads from Joel. Joel. Joel chapter 2. For those of you who don't know where, where it is, I think it's in the Old Testament there. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, somewhere. If you'll go to Joel, the 28th verse, and it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I shall show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said. And in the remnant outside of Jerusalem, the Gentile remnant, whom the Lord shall call. Now, when Peter uses that text he, text, he doesn't use all of it. This is what was prophesied in Joel. I'll, I'll pour out my spirit, Acts chapter 2, upon all flesh. And he goes all the way through that. Uh, 
men of Israel hear these words. Uh, hear these words. I think there's a reason he did that. He wasn't speaking of the remnant that the Lord should call, but to the nation Israel who had already been called all through the Old Testament. Uh, you have God's dealings with Israel who are disobedient, uh, out of fellowship, complaining, grumbling, griping, worshiping Baal, and yet God calls them as His people. And He promises that there's a remnant that He shall call. You know, He told His disciples, other sheep I have, uh, of which are not of this fold, this flock, them also I must bring. The, the burden of Peter's message was to Israel who was already called. They, they already knew they were called. They already professed to be God's people, worshipers of Jehovah. Men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. They knew that. They knew he had given sight to the blind. They knew he had healed the leper. He had made the, the, the crippled, you know, to, to walk the, or, you know, uh, heal the lame, uh, raise the dead. They, they even knew that he had risen from the dead. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel, direction, foreknowledge of God. You've taken him by wicked hands of crucified and there cannot be any argument that it was God, God's foreordination that put Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, Christ said, you don't take my life from me, okay? I lay it down and I'll take it again. And when Pilate argued with him, you know, don't you know I have the power to crucify you or the power to set you free? You know, we know, you remember what his answer was. The Lord uh, said, you don't have any power at all unless God gave it to you. And then, and, and if you interrogate Pilate, you find that seven times he wanted to set him free and what he did was crucify him. Peter doesn't make any excuses about representing the sovereignty and the majesty and the purpose of God. Jesus Christ, dearly beloved, did not die on the cross because the Romans placed Him there or because the Jews falsely accused Him. God put Him there. And Christ gave Himself a ransom for many. The, one, the same one God hath raised having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. If, if we were in a, a class somewhere sitting around having a Bible study, like a home Bible study or something, and uh, I'd spend a lot of time with you teaching you the, the, the impeccability of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it's important, of course, for you to understand that he didn't sin. But dearly beloved, that, that pales insignificance uh, compared to the importance of your understanding that he could not sin. Jesus Christ was God Almighty. He could not sin and it was not possible that he should be held by death. And we get into... Uh, Uh, these verses concerning David. I believe it's the 29th verse of chapter 2. Thirty-three, uh, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. He's poured out what you now see and hear. says that David didn't ascend to heaven. Well, that's, that's enough to kind of tie your ears in knots, you know, when you try to consider a timeless state. 
but I believe the context uh, mitigates for an argument that before David did anything, he said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit on my right hand. Now all the house of Israel ought to assuredly know that God has made this same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. By Lord, he meant uh, Jude, Jehovah. By Christ, he meant the Messiah. God Almighty, Elohim, has made this Jesus of Nazareth, Jehovah, Messiah. And when they, they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, what do we do? Peter said, what do you mean? Uh, uh, what do you do? Well, first of all, you change your mind. Metanoia is the word. It has nothing to do with sorrow. Being sorry it has nothing to do with emotion. It, it's always used in the Word of God as a once-for-all activity. You change your mind and then you are identified with God because you've changed your mind. You know, the, the big argument uh, is that Acts uh, uh, 2.38 is a strong argument for uh, water baptism. The word water does not occur. I'd suggest to you that, that you uh, at least might consider the fact that, that whenever the Holy Spirit uses the word baptism and He means water, he, he, you'll see water with with it. He uses water with it. If he doesn't use water with it, I'd suggest to you that, that you may be pushing the text too far to, to put water there. Christ, Christ said, can you be baptized with the baptism uh, with which I'm presently being baptized? I mean, surely there's no water in that text. John indeed baptized with water, but you'll be baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit, in the sphere of the Holy Spirit. Water was not involved. To say that water is, is intrinsic within the word baptism is simply, well, is, well ignorance of, of the Greek language. The word baptism normally in the English New Testament is an untranslated Greek word. You're reading English words, which are, are translations of Greek words. It's not an English word. It's a Greek word. What you should do is change your mind. That word is an imperative. It's a command. It's active voice. You ought to change your mind and you ought to be identified in or with Jesus Christ because of the remission of sins. Not in order to obtain the remission of sins, but because God has remitted them. That's the ministry of the gospel of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. You ought to change your mind about this procedure. Okay, you're not redeemed by law. You're redeemed because God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ, and you ought to change your mind about that. Not law, but grace. And now be identified with Christ in the sphere of Christ because, because of the remission of sins. Not in order to obtain remission of sins. And then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, for the promises to you. What promise? The one in Joel. Where God's going to pour out His Spirit upon His people. That promise was made to you and to your children. And now Peter gives you the rest of the verse in Joel 2. And it's, it's not only to you and to your children, but to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's Joel 2.32. It's not that Peter tampered with the text, but that Peter skillfully, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, divided the text between Israel and those that are far off, even those whom the Lord our God shall call. And that ends the text in Joel chapter 2. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Deliver yourselves from this perverse generation. 
the word save there. This is, a, this is one of the many cases in the Word of God uh, where obviously the word uh, uh, save does not mean redemption. I, I think Joel was addressing, uh, addressing this prophecy to Israelis. Uh, he was speaking to them saying that, you know, you know, boy, you're not listening to God, but your sons and your daughters will. Just as the Lord said to the Israelites in, in the wilderness, you don't go in and, and take the land. The next generation will. Your sons and your daughters will. He said the same thing to them. Of course they're God's people. The people to whom Joel spoke were God's people. I don't believe you're going to put those people in hell. They were a redeemed nation. They were God's people. And God's saying, you don't, you, know, you don't listen, but your sons and your daughters will. I'm going to pour out my Spirit on them. So, the Lord Jesus Christ said that the Holy Spirit was with you and He shall be in you. Seems as though the Lord Jesus is clearly saying that the Old Testament saint had the Holy Spirit with him. Uh, the New Testament saint has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. I think that the Holy Spirit came upon the Old Testament saint temporarily for service and left. I think that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't think, I know. The New Testament saint has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. You are... If you're a believer, you, you have the very fullness of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living in you. Despite how you might feel at any given moment. There are many Christians who disagree with that, who believe that the Old Testament... Uh, well... It, you know, they, had, they were indwelt, the same as us. It's, it seems to me the Lord was very, very precise in the statement that He made to His disciples. They were already God's people. They needed to change their mind about a lot of grace. These were God's people under the Old Testament law. They need a change of mind. They need to be reconciled to God. And uh, so, He chose them. Uh, if you go back to chapter 1, verse... Uh, uh, two, we see election, He chose them. Uh, in verse 3, He is alive from the dead by many infallible proofs. Uh, also, He spoke to them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's life and service, ministry. Uh, that, was the, that was the focus. This was the beginning of the church. Uh, there, would be, uh, there would be a spiritual baptism they would be identified with Christ. He was not going to restore again the kingdom of Israel at that time. It wasn't for them to know that. They would be witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth. That happened. Don't let anybody tell you we're still waiting for that to happen, the gospel to go around the world. Okay. Well, as soon as it does, the Lord's going to come back. It's an accomplished fact. Uh, 120. Uh, I could go on uh, quite a, quite a, a, a lengthy uh, segment of this about uh, Judas. Uh, I will not do that right now. Uh, so another takes Judas's place. Uh, they were witnesses. Uh, I'm suggesting we are not. We're ambassadors. Uh, God chose Matthias. Uh, Matthias. Uh, he chose. He made the choice. They were all uh, there together in one place. And there were cloven tongues like as of fire it set upon each one of them. Cloven tongues. Folks, that is tongue-shaped, flame-like appearances rising from uh, some beginning point, wherever that, some common center, and dividing, resting upon each of them, 
a beautiful, visible symbol of the burning energy of the Spirit now descending in all His glory upon the church, pouring itself through every tongue uh, and, uh, and over every tribe of men under, under heaven. Uh, James compares a tongue to fire. Uh, James chapter 3. Uh, this was the baptism with fire John the Baptist speaks of. It sat upon each of them. Had the appearance of fire. The, the Syriac and, and, and Arabic versions they read, and they sat upon each, each one of them. Probably their head. Uh, cloven tongues. You know, that must have re reminded them uh, of the division and the confusion of the tongues of the languages of Babel, uh, which gave rise to different nations and different religions. These divided tongues gave rise to the, sp the spreading of the gospel, thereby settling the debate as to what true religion is among the nations. They were all filled, without exception, every single one, they began to speak in, in tongues, of, which as the Spirit gave them utterance, these were, this was not gibberish. It was, there were known languages. Every man heard them speak in his own language. Uh, they were not drunk on new wine. Uh, as many thought, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of borderline here. I'm kind of tempted to think, think that as we preach the gospel on deaf ears today, you know, that the general attitude among those who do not know him and cannot hear or, or, or is that I'm just drunk, you know, I'm drunk on something. Steve, you, Steve, you, you on drugs over there or something, or, you know, something. How can you believe that, you know? Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be delivered. They are already His people, folks. You can't make, turn that into a, well, conditional, if you do something, you'll be redeemed verse. That's not, that's not what that's saying. He was delivered by the determinate uh, counsel and foreknowledge of God. Uh, he, couldn't, uh, he, couldn't, he, he had to raise from the dead because he could not sin. He didn't have the ability to. It's not just that he simply chose not to. He couldn't because he was God Almighty incarnate in human flesh. Uh, baptism, you know, repent and be baptized. Change your mind and be identified with Christ, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins Dearly beloved, one who is not chosen by God cannot do any of that. As many as our Lord, our God, shall call. Save yourselves. That is, deliver yourselves. That's an aorist, uh, imperative, passive voice from this untoward, perverse generation. Then they that gladly received His Word, that's the elect, they were baptized. Aorist, indicative, passive. No mention of water. It's a spiritual baptism. The same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. That's God's work. God's work. Folks, dearly beloved, God works in the lives of His people. Why do we want to take all the credit why do we want to take any of the credit? Well, it's just in our nature, our human DNA, fallen DNA to do so. You know, uh, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. What? Because these folks just made the 
They made the right decision or they determined by their own will and their own strength to do the right thing. And so God was now free to write all of this glorifying everyone for what or their part in all of this and what they did. Is that how you read this book? Thanks for listening. I, uh, I hope that we can make it through this survey. Uh, at least try to cover two chapters a week. Uh, not sure what we're going to do on Wednesdays, but we're going to keep watching and waiting. We love you. Uh, tremendously here at Blessed Hope Forever. Please pray for the, continue to pray for the direction of this ministry. I pray for you all constantly. Uh, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Rest in Him. Thanks for watching.